Thank you very much, Clément. And, and also thank you very much for already giving this morning a very nice introduction on the problems of planet formation and the formation of planetesimals so that I can be a little bit faster in my first slides, which I had not the time yet to kick out after I've seen his work. So, but uh, welcome to my talk. I will talk about hydrodynamic instabilities, right? So you see already the, the, the topics here that I have some dusty disk around young stars and from the dust grains I want to form something bigger which we call planetesimals. These are comets and asteroids today. These are the leftovers of a vast population of objects in the earlier solar nebula. And then you see here already one of my hydrodynamical simulations where I'm plotting vorticity and in fact here forming vortices which are preferential for planet formation. So the introduction can be really fast. I just wanted to show that the idea that planets are forming in a disk comes from the fact that all planets are just in one plane. And if you are actually looking for uh, disks in, in, in the sky, then you have to go, for instance, to the Orion Nebula. And the Orion Nebula is so wonderful, colorful here. And if you zoom in and you're asking where are planets forming, then you have to look where stars are forming. And then eventually you in fact find here this wonderful uh, flying saucer-like object. And this is now a disk around a young star. You see a little bit the scattered light above and below, and you see the big shadow, and this means the disk is full of gas, but also full of little dust grains, out of which we are then forming our planets. And if you now ask why are we believing that these disks are turbulent, then it's not only the angular momentum transfer, mass transfer from the disk to the star, but it's also simply the fact that these disks are thick. So this is now an artist's impression, uh, which shows you that it looks like here, like a gigantic fluffy dust cloud. And of course, if there wouldn't be gas and if there wouldn't be a turbulence, then disks should be absolutely razor thin, like here, Saturn's rings. So already the fact that the dust is being transported around tells us that they must be turbulent. So if, we are, if I'm now imagining how the protoplanet disk might be looking like uh, from close up and maybe even within, then just think about a desert storm where all your little dust trains are flying through the air and being transported and the thing almost looks like the artist's impression before. And um, this are now many reasons why we believe that there is turbulence and Right now, I'm just focusing on the fact on how using turbulence in order to form uh, planetesimals from these little dust grains. So you could, in, in why one possibility of forming planets, the idea was that small dust grains are sticking and forming larger and larger entities. But if you've ever been to the beach or been to the desert and a desert storm, then you see that even there is a lot of motion and collisions, particles are not growing, they are grinding down to become smaller and smaller. So the idea is what Clément already mentioned, that we are locally concentrating huge piles of pebbles and then we have a gravitational collapse here into a gravitational collapse into, uh, into a planetesimal. So we have been doing a lot of magnetorotational instability simulations, a popular way in creating turbulence in disks around central objects for accretion disk around black holes, uh, neutron stars, and, and uh, white dwarfs, and, and here also around young stars, is to invoke the action of magnetic fields. And you saw here uh, uh, the first big simulation we have been doing, a student and myself, uh, years ago, which was self-consistently generating its own magnetic field, here plotted as the ratio between magnetic pressure and gas pressure, and you see that there's a minimum, white means low values, so this is a typical regime which you would need for the magneto-rotational instability to operate in a disk. But unfortunately, or maybe good uh, to pursue new and more work is that our disk around a young star is probably at very low temperatures and it's full of little dust grains. And this means the ionization rate is very, very low. So if you're working around a black hole, you want to explain accretion there, uh, you have temperatures uh, thousands and ten thousands of Kelvin, and then it's easy to have a fully ionized plasma. 
But this is for the protoplanetary disk, the disk around young star, only fulfilled very close into the star here. Let's say maybe 0.3 AU. So this is basically just out to Mercury's orbit somewhere here. So at the places where we are forming the planets, we have a lot of dust grains and we have then non-ideal MHD effects like resistivity, ambipolar diffusion, and the Hall effect. And they make things more complicated. And so the linear MRI is simply switched off. It cannot operate anymore. And interesting physics starts uh, to play a role. Hall effect can, for instance, produce some winds here, but not necessarily turbulence. And I placed here some red dots in, and here a blue dot. And this means this could be regions where hydrodynamical instabilities are actually coming into play. Why is it so complicated to have a hydrodynamical instability uh, in a disk? The reason is that these disks are typically Rayleigh stable. This means with distance from the star, the angular momentum increases, and this means it's, uh, it's linearly stable, and experiments and numerical experiments have shown that, uh, and they are getting more and more conclusive, that there is also not a nonlinear instability. For many years it was believed that the taylor coet flow, where you can mimic such a Keplerian flow could become unstable at very high Reynolds numbers. But these were always now flaws in the experimental setup, and we now believe that a pure barotropic flow is not unstable. But this can be different. Oh, the movie. Oops. Okay, the movie doesn't want. Okay, let's continue. So if you're forming vortices in the disk, then things are concentrating here, dust grains. And these are just some simulations from the past where we have been simulating chunks of the disk. You're plotting the vorticity, and then you find how dust grains are being concentrated inside. Clement has already been talking about this. And this movie works. And then I just wanted to add one movie. So if things are getting concentrated inside a vortex here, for instance, then you're triggering here the streaming instability. And in this simulation, we also have self-gravity among the pebbles, among the sand cranes, which are in there. And then you see that eventually they are starting to contract and here forming gravitationally bound objects. And this is a method in order how we are forming our planets. Ah. So, Coming back, we want to know, to understand what are the properties of turbulence inside the region which is dead with respect to magnetic fields. And I will talk about three different instabilities, and that after my talk you will remember that I was talking about three different new instabilities which are working together and not against each other. I've chosen here the three musketeers of hydro instabilities um, to, to, uh, to explain the individual three uh, methods which have now established. Again, so if you're just looking at the uh, equation for the radial stability of this, then you have here the angular momentum term, which is now, which would be only the Rayleigh criterion, but now you're adding here also entropy and pressure gradient, and this means radial stratification of the disk can become convectively unstable, and one also has to consider vertical gradients in the disk. If there are vertical variations in the entropy gradient and vertical variations in the angular momentum trend, uh, angular momentum properties of the disk, then this also can become uh, unstable. And one thing, for instance, is that if a disk has a radial temperature gradient, then it's not constant rotation on cylinders, but on parabolas. So this leads us already to the first of the instabilities, which is the goldreich schubert fricke instability. It was first developed for stellar interiors. It's also now known as a vertical shear instability. And this is the first one I will talk about. If you have a disk which is irradiated from the central star, then it will have a temperature gradient in the radial distance. And this means, if you calculate the pressure and uh, rotational balance, that there is a vertical shear in the disk. And this shear is unstable. I can show you first the simulation by Richard Nelson. These are vertical velocity perturbations which are becoming unstable. 
So this, uh, this should already have occurred in simulations like 20, 30 years ago when for the first time these disks were simulated. But it was simply not possible because the resolution at this time was much too low. And only at a time when people were doing minute rotation instabilities, wanted to have a stable setup, go to very high resolutions, then suddenly the simple isothermal setups always become uh, numerically unstable. And this led Richard then to the investigation on the cause, on the cause of this uh, instability, and then he discovered uh, that this is a goldreich schubert trigger instability. It's, it can be explained like this. If you plot here distance and height, you have your lines of constant omega, of constant rotation frequency, then you can overplot here a line of constant specific angular momentum, which of course is now bound outward, and you can add another line, omega square r square, which, be, which, be, uh, which would be constant kinetic energy. And now you see that there's an inclination between the lines of constant specific angular momentum and constant um, kinetic energy, and this means if you now move a particle upward along these lines of constant specific angular momentum, then you will become unstable and you can release energy in this method. So it's basically again a violation of the, of the, of the Rayleigh criterion, but this time using also the vertical component. A second instability I've been spending quite some time is a, a, a baroclitic instability, but meanwhile I like to call it a convective overstability. Uh, I, I first saw this many years ago at what I called a high resolution simulation then. This must have been in 1999, this plot here, plotting here vorticity in the disk. Red means negative vorticity, distance from the star, and azimuthal extent here 90 degrees, which was 100 by 40 by 120 cells. I was running this on a supercomputer in San Diego at these days. Meanwhile, we can have higher resolution. So in these simulations where I was aiming at thermal convection in this, I suddenly found these vortices and then spent the next years in trying to understand where they come from. Oh, this. Ah, so in, in this movie, this is one of the more modern simulations. You see first density fluctuations, you see a lot of spiral waves, and as we also heard in the talk before, these spiral waves are very efficient in transporting angular momentum in the disk, but they are shed from vortices, which have spontaneously forming here in the disk as a result of the radial entropy gradient. So you can imagine this like this, distance from the star, this is the azimuthal direction, inner part is warmer, outer part is cooler. If you now have an unstable stratified disk, then this vortex here will just act as a convective cell transporting heat outward and having cold gas flow inward. It's difficult to do a linear stability in a sharing medium, therefore we were really happy to understand one day that you can also look at a radial vertical convection in the disk where again the radial entropy gradient is driving things. And you can derive a very simple dispersion relation of fifth order and uh, then covering basically all the aforementioned instabilities. So. Uh, you can then also do the proper simulation on, yeah, on, on just a part of the disk, which is axisymmetric, and there you find now many of those little convection cells in here, so it's basically velocity which is plotted right, then also means it's a little cell which has been forming in here. And you can also do high, high resolution stuff and then really just look how in the linear state this instability is forming these wonderful little cells, which means that now uh, the numerical method and the linear prediction of what should happen goes hand in hand for these, for these simulations. You can now then also define different regimes. Here I'm plotting growth rates as a function of the local thermal relaxation time. So 10 to 4 means 10 to 4 orbits until the gas has adapted the background temperature and 10 to minus 4 that it's almost instantaneously. So you see that the convective overstability has a maximum in its growth rates when cooling time and the dynamical time scale are basically on the same, um, on the same order of magnitude and if you have very short short cooling times, only then you get this goldreich schubert fricke instability, which is then dominating the disk. So we have now two different instabilities and two different regimes when they would be operating perfectly. And the first numerical results give us roughly the right location in here. <laughs> 
So the last instability is the, is the least understood by, uh, I think, right now. And this is uh, because there is not, not such a detailed linear uh, analysis possible. The idea is here that uh, numerical simulations have shown that a disk which was initially turbulent is forming one vortex, and then this vortex is shedding waves. The shapes get trapped as a resonance layer, which will become unstable and then form more and more vortices. So Phil Marcus is calling this vortices. And uh, the, the point here is that the disk has to be vertically stratified in a stable way in, uh, in order to have this wave propagation possible in the first place. So this would mean now they are in the regime when the cooling time of the disk is very, very long. And, and then this gives you now three different regimes here for the disk. Here I'm plotting the cooling time. Infinite means no cooling. Zero cooling means instantaneously. And this is a value here plotting the vertical stratification of the disk buoyancy frequency divided by the isothermal buoyancy frequency. And, and for, for the isothermal disk. And then you see Goldreich Schubert Fricke is in this regime, convective overstability somewhere here, and zombie vortices, what I just mentioned before, maybe somewhere up. But for the third case here, uh, simulations are not yet as reliable as for the other cases. So, three different instabilities. Now, let's put them to a test on our computers. So the typical simulations, which I show you now, are using like 40,960 uh, cores. I'm using the Pluto code uh, by Andrea Mignone. Hydra is our cluster in the supercomputing center in Garching. It's, for these purposes, even better suited than Uqueen, where we also have time. The grid size is 1,000 in radius, 512 uh, vertical, and 256 in azimuth for 90 degree pies. And this means that 1,000 orbits, so we have very slow cooling times is like 100 million uh, core hours on this machine. So we have to be very patient and we are already looking for the next generation of machines. We cannot go to lower resolution, otherwise we are damping out these very, very weak instabilities. So we are using then Runge Kutta 3 for the integration in here, uh, this HLLC hydro solver, and then either Vino 3, so uh, essentially non-oscillatory map, or a PPM like parabolic integration. Even then, using linear interpolation will not give you any instability. A quick test simulation where we artificially said that the disk has no radial temperature gradient and instantaneous cooling, and even after many, many orbits, the disk is perfectly stable. So this is just a test that our hydro scheme is fine. And I'm sometimes now showing here uh, the turbulent stresses in the disk. They are really low, as low as 10 to minus 7, so this is just a little bit of noise. But if we go now to a disk which has a strong radial temperature gradient, R2 to minus 2, and a thermal relaxation time of 1, then you see some very interesting radial structure. And I've, I've shown this pi here before. In, in this even, I can now only do 90 degrees for this convective overstability simulation here with medium uh, cooling times. I find now, after some orbits, the formation here of these long-lived vortices, which are then growing from getting uh, more and more energy pumped into them from the radial entropy gradient. Right, so this is basically a time series of models, and we are now in the state of analyzing these vortices. If you look from the side, then you see get some structure here of one vortex. This again vorticity, meaning that's a laminar region where you have now the eye of a hurricane. It's relatively quiet in there, and then you have a lot of noise and waves and turbulence all around that part. So the Reynolds stresses, and this is always what people are aiming for when they are talking about angular momentum transport in disks, is now pretty large because the vortices are shedding waves and waves are transporting angular momentum. At a level here of three times 10 to minus three in alpha language, which is as much as you can expect, for instance, of fully developed magnetic rotational instability uh, stuff. So it's very competitive, so if your disk is dead enough, then this can be a very important effect. And the angular momentum transpose is constant over time, so that's really nice. If you go now to a, to a different regime, when I said you have very, very short cooling times in the disk, so the vertical shear instability, then things are looking way more, uh, way more chaotic in this, uh, in this uh, in the simulation, you see again vertical cells which have been forming at a very strong uh, perturbation here in, in vorticity. 
So tau has been chosen here now as being zero, and also I did not find any long-lived vortices in this simulation at the same resolution here as I've been using in the simulation before. But now my student, Natasha Manger, has been doing a, a field study. So she was using a crit was, which was a little bit coarser, 256, 128, 786, but then was able to go for 2 pi in azimuth direction. So, as I said before, for the convective overstability, which is a very, very weak instability, we needed a very high resolution. But the vertical shear instability at these parameters is very, very strong. So we were confident that we would be able to, uh, to resolve uh, this, uh, the, the unstable modes in this resolution. And, in fact, the disk is becoming unstable as predicted, just as a comparison. Previous simulations which are published are only spanning like 90 degrees of a disk, so she's basically doing the first 360 degree simulations for this problem. She's plotting vorticity, it takes some orbits, and then eventually you see not only small vortices arise in here, but there's already a big one. And Again, a few hundred orbits later, you find then more vortices also forming here at other distances. So I'm running out of time. That's why I also already show you a time evolution sequence, 200 orbits, 500 orbits, 700 orbits. And you see here then 90 degrees, one, you know, 45 90, 180, and 360 degrees in azimuth. And in the bigger ones, here you find now these very long-lived, gigantic vortices to have formed in here. And you don't find anything like this if you go for the small, small azimuthal extent. And also all these simulations were only possible now on the Hydra cluster in Garching. The alpha values which you are getting from, uh, from these vortices is still a little bit weaker than what you get from the convective overstability. So it's on the order of 10 to minus 3, let's say 0.5 times 10 to minus 3 up to, uh, up to a few times 10 to minus 3 if you are further away from the midplane. Again, so the black and green line is for the 360 degree simulations where you have vortices shedding waves and blue and red is for the tiny sections sections 45 and 90 degrees when especially in the midplane stresses are much weaker. So we were also checking for the lifetime of the vortices. This is now a radial and a time diagram here. This is now time in orbits and we are plotting then always the minimum of vorticity for one given for one given um, uh, or for one given distance from the star and which means that vortices show up as dark green bands so which you find here in the 180 and 360 degrees we see how vortices are forming here they are basically stationary and here they are drifting a little bit and you also can observe mergers in here so something which is not possible at the low resolution cases so i'm Coming to my conclusions, so independent on what driver of turbulence you have in a disk, be it uh, non-ideal MHD or be it vertical shear or be it uh, radial entropy gradients, if you, uh, if you do this, if you resolve your physics of the disk properly, it will always end up in vortices and will always end up in zonal flows. Uh, I've, and, and this is, of course, not a surprise because any system which we observe which is rotating and which has some energy driver, be it the atmosphere of Jupiter, be it here the North Pole of, uh, uh, of Saturn, it always will form vortices in there. And now, meanwhile, we also know that the disks which are being observed also have funny ring and vortex structures in them, so they might be very much alike. And by putting up here my conclusions, I'm finishing my talk and I'm happy to answer any possible questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hubert. If you have any question, yeah. Could you perhaps comment on the effect these instabilities have on the vertical thickness of your disks? <laughs> 
um, base, no, no effect. So all the turbulence is strongly subsonic. Even in the magnetorotation and stability case, you have uh, Mach numbers of 0.05, maybe 0.1, which means that um, still the vertical thickness is completely dominated by the gas pressure and not by the turbulent motions. Yeah, Lucio? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, how important is the self-gravity of the disks that you've been showing? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in the simulations we are, we are looking at, this is already at relatively late stages when self-gravity is no longer so important. It's at Toomer values 10 and above. So on the other hand, if you then go for the dust concentrations, then it's a different question, and the dust concentrations themselves become gravitationally unstable. So, so how robust are these instabilities with respect to viscosity? If you have some other source mm -hmm. that produces viscosity in, in this? It's, it's, it's a question. So I, I think there, there is no instability which is producing viscosity on these levels. So yeah. viscosity, even if you look for, for magnetic rotation instability, yeah. is, is, is a large-scale effect. It's not produced on the, on the grid level or somewhere yeah. there, but on some intermediate scale, like a, a fraction of the pressure scale height. Yeah. So uh, th therefore, viscosity is, is probably not destroying them. So yeah. what can be destroying them is um, interaction with magnetic field lines. So I had the work with Vladimir Lyra when we were looking how much, uh, how much resistivity do we need in order to have the, the field lines move through our vortices. And it's again very simple. So if, you're, if your diffusion time for magnetic field lines is shorter than the overturn time of that a vortex, is, yeah, then the destroyed. vortex will not be destroyed. So on the other hand, if you're interested to create magnetic fields by a vortex, then you have to be in the different regime. So mm -hmm. that, and then you need a very strong vortex, but, but we, also have sh uh, we also found that in that case, even a very weak field will be uh, twisted up inside the vortex mm -hmm. and make the vortex itself magnetically unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's maybe also a question to the first speaker. I was wondering how you treat the boundary conditions in the vertical and the radial directions and avoid artifacts from reflections or whatever. Yeah. So, so, so very, very difficulty. <laughs> so, and it's and it's not easy. So, in the uh, in the in the old Pluto version, I was using the uh, I was not happy with the existing boundary conditions, and, and 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 Clement helped me a lot to have basically absorbing boundary conditions. So, in in some sense, it's uh, it's you, you can also then say something about it. It was that we were uh, absorbing waves when they're approaching the boundaries, and so in the, my early simulations, I was losing then. Some, quite some grid cells by having basically a damping layer, a sponge layer. Now, in the, in the latest Pluto uh, 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 version, the, the boundary conditions are, even in the so-called reflecting way, so perfect that, that you can use them. So by just a small modification to this, you can, uh, you can have your waves not being reflected uh, anymore because it's, it's just now a perfect parabolic scheme and interpolation at the boundary. So the latest simulation I'm simply doing with... Uh, Almost unchanged reflecting boundary conditions um, for the for the uh, for the boundaries, but um, not letting information come in. Right, but 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 yeah. he has basically in, put a lot of energy in the perfect in, boundary conditions. Yes, I work a lot, and in my case, um, it's also kind of absorbing in in the Rosby code, but. Uh, uh, we, we are allowed to have some uh, inflow or outflow from the boundaries. It's a kind of free boundary conditions where we, um, uh, we, we kind of extrapolate the values that we have at the, at the last cells of the domain in, inside the ghost cells, sharing it following the, the Keplerian, uh, the, the angular, mom, um, yes, the Keplerian uh, 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 velocity and, and dumping it. So it's, a, it's similar. You, you need to have some dumping conditions at one point, otherwise you trigger some 
artif artificial instabilities at the, at the edge of the disk, like the uh, Papalozu Pringles uh, instability, etc. So, yeah, by by joining our efforts on on, on the on the different codes, uh, I yes, in the vertical, I uh, I am also doing this kind of zero gradient free boundary conditions, in fact. Uh, and it's working well. Uh, but I, I didn't uh, run a lot of 3D simulations for the moment. It's only at, at, at the development stage. But uh, Hubert, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. can, you, can you explicit your vertical? So in, in, in the early simulation, I was using sponge layers, then sacrificing basically the half, last half pressure scale height of the disk. But in the latest ones, I'm simply using, again, these reflecting boundary conditions. And it's, the question is not, not so much whether it changes my instability, but more whether the scheme is numerically stable.